So welcome to you talking with Greg. I'm here with Brad Kirshner, my good friend and fellow Theory of Knowledge Society member who is out there doing beautiful things in the world of education. In fact, he's the author of the book, Educational Complexity, Integrating Practices and Perspectives for 21st Century Leadership. He had a wonderful Jim Rutt podcast that I enjoyed tremendously. Um, and anybody listening to that knows that he's interested in all sorts of topics uh, that the Utah crowd and this meta modern crowd is really interested in. A school leader, independent scholar, starting a whole new independent Waldorf school leadership position in uh, Pennsylvania. Brad, welcome so much to the program. Hey, Greg. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's good to see you. Yeah, man. It's really good to see you again. Uh, I know we tangle in similar spaces. I know you're doing really uh, excellent work bridging between sort of high abstract ideas and connecting to people. Um, but I often like to kind of start with a kind of people's kind of general narrative so we can locate where you are in space. And, you know, I'm a clinician, so I like the storied aspect of that and what gives people lives, their trajectory and meaning. So uh, can you share a little bit about that and where you're coming from? Yeah, yeah. Let me give a little spiritual autobiography, so to speak. Beautiful. So I uh, and and it it was religious spiritual from the beginning in a way, and that I'm the son of a preacher and also the grandson of a preacher. So ah, I feel like okay. I've always had a little preacher in me. Yeah. But I was also a very post-conventional teenager. Mm. By the time I was in middle school, I was really in a place where I was rejecting the mm. church and not identifying with that at all. And uh, when I was, I can hang with post-conventional thought. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was that very sort of critical, sort of didn't buy it teenager. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't buy into grades or, you know, that I should care about school or money or, or anything. You know, and some of my, some of my high school friends called me Socrates. You know, which was the sort of <laughs> Bill and Ted's play on. <laughs> I got some of that shit. You That's know, hysterical. I, I kind of had, I, I had some inklings of that as a teenager. And then, you know, I went to college, goofed around, got straight A's, but really didn't care and actually dropped out after a couple of years huh. and just went and traveled. So when I was 20, I went to Europe and just traveled mm -hmm. around for a few months. Mm -hmm. And that really blew my world open. I met people who really were, without a doubt at that point, the most interesting people I had met thus far. Right. I remember when I was in Greece, I met a man from Australia who had lived in India for four or five years, mm -hmm. and he and I ended up traveling together for a couple of weeks, and oh, wow. I was just so, I was so hungry, you know, I hadn't really been exposed to people who had really that sort of breadth and depth of experience, right. and, you know, he was vegan, and he had studied yoga and meditation for a long time, um, hmm. you know, so I just kind of traveled with him for a while, asked him tons of questions. When I got home, I was a changed person. And I remember yeah. just going online and ordering a bunch of books. Oh, um, so you went on that journey to find yourself and yeah, found books really out did. there. Oh, and it happened. And then, I, and then I moved to New York City mm -hmm. and really devoted myself towards study and, and meditation. Mm -hmm. And one day in a, in a Barnes and Noble, I came across Ken Wilber totally randomly. Mm -hmm. And I just knew that there was something important there. Yeah. And basically, over the course of my 20s, you know, I read through the collected works of, of Wilbur and Integral Theory. And the main thing I got from that was the importance of meditation. You know, it's sort of an interesting, for me, it really hit me as it's not about the theory and the map. It's actually that now I have a map to understand my own trajectory. Like right. I sort of had this deep um, intuition that there is this path of potential of growing mm -hmm. up and waking up, but having a map to really explain it really gave deep motivation and a sort of deep, um, deep sort of faith that if I really engaged meditation and study seriously, there would be, mm. there'd be fruits to that labor. Beautiful. Um, Did you have a particular practice or are you following it? Particular... Yeah. So actually, you know, I bounced around and ended up getting an undergraduate degree in philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved to San Francisco and I met a very serious Zen teacher in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, sat with him at least once a week for, for over a year. Um, and so I kind of started with Zen with like a, a sort of formal, like personal Zen teacher. Mm -hmm. And then I found Vipassana retreats, which was a great way to spend 10 days in silence, meditating for 12 hours a day. Wow. So again, over the course of about a decade, I did about a dozen 10 day silent meditation retreats. God. Um, and ended up going to graduate school to get a PhD in religious studies, 
Hmm. Um, and I had done pretty well as a student. So I went to the University of Chicago and was really on a track to be a professor of religion, actually. And at that point, I had totally downloaded integral theory. I had gone pretty deeply into the secondary literature, reading people like Gebser, uh, um, you know, reading Whitehead. You know, I ended up, while at Chicago, was able to connect with a Whitehead scholar and really focused like pretty deeply on Heidegger and Hegel and Whitehead. Wow. And, and, and also Husserl and, and, and phenomenology and was really able to, to do the more academic deep dive into philosophy after already having sort of downloaded integral theory as a background operating system and really wanted to help academia. I really came, you know, as someone in my mid 20s pursuing a doctorate in religious studies, I came with the intentionality to really be of service to academia to help them broaden their scope a little bit and bring some of the key insights that Wilbur had brought to light right. to academia, you know, because it was really clear to me, sort of obviously, that um, that the ivory tower was sort of locked in a very narrow, huh? world, right, <laughs> which you know very well. So I saw this pretty clearly, and I was I benefited from having the sort of academic rigor of that structure. But after the course of two years at Chicago, I realized that uh, I was incredibly, you know, naive and that nobody was going to really, uh, I, I didn't really connect with any professors who were, I felt were open-minded enough to really integrate more wisdom into what their sort of understanding of what their role and job and work was. Well, the, the nature uh, of it, academic sausage is yeah, such that it exactly. tends to grind into you. <laughs> exactly. So the best thing that came out of that time was, frankly, that I met my wife in, yeah. in Chicago. And so, mm -hmm. so, so that was a win. Right, so, then win I, there, yeah. so I basically dropped, didn't finish the doctoral program, um, moved back to San Francisco and decided to be a preschool teacher again, which is what I had done in the past. Mm -hmm. And actually, so the whole time I had sort of bounced back and forth between working with young children and being a kindergarten or preschool teacher and being an academic. Um, and that came partly influenced by my Zen initiation, where I sort of always had this ideal of like moving through all the stages of human awakening, uh, landing in this place of like thinking of like the 10th ox herding picture, mm -hmm. where, you know, basically at the end of your whole journey, you really end up just being this jolly That's man when it goes back to the world. And there's really nothing higher than really just living a joyful, loving life with people. I um, and I sort of refracted that vision through the idea of actually just being a kindergarten teacher and just enjoying being that sort of jolly, awakened Buddha with children. You know, that was sort of my that. archetype in a way. But I always had this also this academic intellectual itch that needed to be scratched. That's really well. fascinating. My my mother's a kindergarten teacher, and I think I embodied yeah. that and that manifests in my yeah. And my own journey as sort of maternal caretaker for psychotherapy and the lost yeah. souls and that source. And my dad's a professor, although my mom then ends up getting her doctorate and becomes uh, sort of intellectually academically oriented. But so that's, a, yeah. I really find that dialectic in yeah. you, something that I, I can look at my own heart, soul, mind, et cetera, uh, and see those reflections. So that's really fascinating to hear. Yeah, no, these are important archetypes, you know, the, the caregiver, the really grounded, um, embodied, relational, sort of wisdom of just being, whether it's with your children or other people's children or anyone. And then also the archetype of like the scholar, the, uh, totally. the, 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 the Manjushri, so to speak. So yeah, so I sort of, you know, I went back to teaching for a while, but then I sort of in that sort of dialectic, I found that actually one way forward for me might, to be, might be to get a doctorate in education. So I actually went back to grad school and ended up getting my PhD in education. And again, was on a track to be a professor of education, but realized once again, for a lot of the same reasons, being a professor of education wouldn't really be more fulfilling than being a professor of religion for a lot of the same reasons. Right. Um, but I found educational leadership as a way to really try to hold, in some ways, holding multiple archetypes simultaneously through the embodied work of being a leader, like having oh. the intellectual background of like leadership and helping people to sort of deepen their understanding and their work and guiding adults in their work, mm. but also very concrete, very engaged, very embodied, not just, not just, you know, 
writing I'm, and thinking. I'm getting some associations here to Zach Stein in terms of his broad view of, le of education and its fundamental challenge to cultivate the teacherly authority and the legitimacy of, of our socialization processes. Uh, are you familiar with his stuff? Oh yeah, I thought you knew. You know, Zach's a close friend of mine. Yeah, yeah I thought I knew that. I was trying to replace that, but I, I didn't actually, want to jump that in there and, yeah, and no, misremember it's, it's been it. Cool Sometimes I can have you um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's been awesome to see Zach really having his voice heard in these in these meta modern spaces because I connected with him back in my integral days. You know, I was really blessed to to really get to know in real life, you know, and actually spend embodied time with people like the late great Terry Patton and yeah. Zach Stein, Dustin DePerna, John Churchill. You know, ma ma many of the the sort of second, first and second generation of sort of integral mm -hmm. theory community. Right. Um, and yes, Zach and I have been in dialogue. Actually, um, yeah, we can talk more about like the way he and I are, are have been in, in conversation. I actually mm -hmm. did a little bit of work with the Consilience Project. And it was actually really close to working full time with the Consilience Project, but ended up choosing to take on this new school leadership position instead. Yeah, yeah. So those are some recent developments. You have a book that you uh, generated, and then you also transitioned into the school. Maybe we pick up the story there. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, I've ended up finding school leadership to be a really fulfilling vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, and in that, it's been interesting, too, of doing a deep dive, getting my doctorate in education, learning about really the history of public education, what's wrong with the system of education. I worked in public schools and public charter schools as a principal in, in urban Boston for a while and really came face to face with a lot of the deep systemic problems of public education. And a lot of that is in my book. So my book, Understanding Educational Complexity, really builds on two in-depth case studies of urban schools huh. and sort of what it would really take. It's just an unpacking of what it would really take to understand what is going on at these schools. Like wow. you can't just, and part of the argument is even if you spend a lot of time in a school, even if you are a principal of a school, you can't actually understand what's going on in that school if you don't understand the larger context and the historical context of how everything at that school came to be, how the society sort of influences and interpenetrates that school. And if you don't understand developmental psychology or have some framework for understanding the different perspectives that people are taking on education. Because one thing that I found working in public education is even if you somehow bracket all of the demographic and economic injustices and inequalities that manifest in education, you still are left with perspectival diversity and philosophical diversity. And the fact that actually not everyone looks at the goals and aims of education in the same way. Oh. Um, and what I found was that even though I was surrounded by amazing, well-intentioned people who are all there for all the right reasons to serve children and families, there was a real lack of depth of thought and educational philosophy that was present in the public education system. Totally. Where I, 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 I more and more got the sense that it was gonna be really hard for me to really even just cohere with a group of like-minded people to try to take a school in the direction that I wanted to take it. So I ended up then becoming the leader of a Quaker school in North Carolina, mm -hmm. North Carolina and was mm -hmm. Director actually, of a, actually, I'll pause there for just a sec because there's deep parallels again. Uh, so, in from 1999 2003, I run in, in the I'm at the University of Pennsylvania and I'm running this project, uh, a mental health project, cognitive therapy under Beck, uh, Aaron Beck for suicide attempters. Uh, and uh, these are individuals that come in uh, to an inner city Philadelphia hospital, having recently made a suicide attempt, who live in that, you know. West Philly urban ecology uh, that has just layers upon layers of rich but tragic history built upon it uh, and managing the and looking at the ecology of the way the mental health system tried to create a developmental frame for these people where they are to where we would give them and looking at the futility of that because the failure to appreciate the socio-ecological historical context and all of the uh, variables that went into that, that manifested itself in some particular ways. It, it was really quite striking. Um, it was heartening to connect with people at times. It was disheartening to think about the magnitude of the structural dynamics. Uh, so I just see a lot, hearing at least potentially a lot of parallels between your experience and 
my yeah. experience in that context. Yeah, it's there's so many layers to it again, which is why it's all about understanding educational complexity and peeling back all the layers. It, it, it's a lot and it's overwhelming and, and we really have our work cut out for us. But again, I think a, a, a basic premise that you and I would agree with is that if you don't have a deep understanding of the problem, you don't you can't solve it. So, you know, and so I keep coming back to like helping people that I'm working with understand the kinds of questions that have to be asked. And there, there's so much energy being put toward making things better without clarity and coherence in terms of what's the worldview, what's the theory of action, what's the philosophy of education, what's our understanding of human development, what's our understanding of what it means to be a healthy community. Like there are, you know, what's our understanding of healthy and secure attachment? Like all of Reach these- it, brother. Exactly. <laughs> Like there have to be clear, coherent inputs into any system that's going to be even close to healthy and, and sustainable. And there's just a real lack of, of depth and breadth in terms of the kinds of frameworks that people are bringing to bear on these really important questions. So everyone can say they care about education and everybody wants the public education system to be better. But if you really just slow down a little bit and drill down to what do you mean by that? What does that look like to you? How are you assessing educational value and quality? What are the goals and aims of education? What constitutes quality education? You're going to get a wide range of incoherent answers, um, which speaks to the sort of inadequacies of our education system and the fact that we haven't really... Um, and knowledge systems that ground them. Exactly. So it, 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 it's a hmm. it's a wicked feedback loop. There wicked feedback loop. In terms yeah, of yeah, completely agree. Okay, who's chaotic, fragmented pluralism, and you know, then what are we doing, and then what are we grounded in the doing of it? So then you go to a Quaker school, huh? Yeah. So the thing. So my basic move is okay. Can I find an island of sanity? You know, like can I can I bring it down to a smaller scale? And can I be in a community? I can't fix the whole world right now all at once. I'll keep trying, but I'm, I'm sort of feeling Call like- Call me when you do, Brad. I'll have you back in the program. <laughs> I'm probably not going to completely evolve the public educational system through the force of my will and genius or whatever. So maybe, maybe not try to do that. Maybe just try to find a community that I can you know, help um, as much as possible. So found a Quaker school, learned a lot there, lovely, lovely community. Um, Can you give a little bit of background for uh, folks that aren't familiar with the Quaker yeah. philosophy, well, lifestyle, yeah, so way Quakerism, of being? Yeah, Quakerism, it's a beautiful tradition. And my family and I, as, as part of our joining this school, we actually did start going to Quaker meetings once in a while, really just to kind of experiment and just experience and just see what it was about. And we ended up keep going pretty consistently because they have a really beautiful tradition of sitting in silence and it's a really unstructured approach to meditation you know it's sort of funny being at a quaker school i would like to say things like you know mindfulness is really catching on now and lots of schools are talking about doing mindfulness but quakers have been practicing silence and mindfulness you know for for centuries and just not calling it that no. and actually every quaker school that i'm aware of and the one that i worked at they have very um consistent rituals around just spending time in silence together. So there's not a lot of direction and instruction in terms of meditation, but every day children spend some time in silence. And every week groups of people come together and spend 20 to 30 minutes in silence together. Um, so for instance, like my daughter in, in the middle school there, every single morning, the whole middle school would gather and just sit in 10 minutes of silence together, you know, 150 children and staff. And for 10 minutes, you can hear a pin drop. You know, and just starting your day like that is meaningful. Or even for us at the staff level, every single meeting that we had, we would begin with a few minutes of silence and we would end with a few minutes of silence. Right. So right. just just having a sort of ritualized structure for people mm -hmm. to get comfortable mm -hmm. with 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 silence and stillness and being, you know, just actually it really is a sort of um, very natural and simple way to get people accustomed to opening up that more groundedness in, right. in in awareness right yes. and just like being in the moment and to have that be just a very normal natural part of everyday life every single day you're having multiple opportunities to just drop into silence and stillness it's a really healthy thing totally 
Totally. Overall. In fact, uh, and we were talking about this briefly prior to coming on. So for me, uh, you know, my evolution from behavioral scientist, clinical psychologist into spirituality and then various meditative practice, the Eastern traditions, et cetera. And what I'm seeing is this unbelievable potential for complementarity. I'm certainly not the only one. Wilbur's in this ballpark as well. Um, but as my knowledge as a psychotherapist is anchored in what I would now call the self stream, okay, which is a person's felt sense of being in the world, their cares, their wants, both at their sort of the primate experiential level, their narrating uh, egoic level and their persona. And it's about, oh gosh, you know, am I liked, am I cared for? Super important stuff, the relationship between all that, it's all the meaning. Um, and then there's this other stream that I did a blog on this recently and you can then orient simply to ground of being or pure awareness. Uh, what we're simply presented with, with the witness function, uh, which is the so much of the focus of those Eastern traditions and meditative practices. So I really see this sort of like capacity of psychological mindfulness. Uh, I have this thing called calm MO, which kind of regulates the relations inside and out and how to cultivate virtuous cycles. And then also the cultivation of this awareness and being and what that is like and the groundedness and the pure awareness structures uh, for us to attend to. And I really would love to see uh, more integrated complementarity between these systems to help us see ourselves as whole and to utilize strengths from various healing traditions to cultivate that. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. And there's so many entry points and there's so many different ways to think about and talk about these sort of distinctions. But in one way or another, we have to find our way to actually experientially practicing and embodying uh, conscious awareness of awareness, right? Awareness of awareness practices. You know, I mentioned I started with Zen and then did a lot of Vipassana retreats. Mm -hmm. And I was also blessed when I lived in Boston to getting my doctorate. Um, I was fortunate to be exposed to Dr. Dan Brown, who's a meditation teacher in the mm -hmm. Tibetan Mahamudra lineage mm -hmm. and did some retreats and work with Dr. Dan Brown and Dr. John Churchill and other sort of people who are really bringing a really sophisticated and coherent Tibetan Mahamudra perspective on Buddhist yeah. psychology and really integrating that with Western developmental psychology. There's a lot of awesome integration happening in terms of Buddhist psychology and Western developmental psychology and the ways to understand some of these distinctions. But at the end of the day, spending time in silence and stillness is, is an entry point, right? And there totally. are very simple, like the kind of shift that you're talking about or just the stream of awareness, like there are very simple ways to point out basically, and to offer pointing out instructions for people to start to make these distinctions within their own mind. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is, yes, how do we cultivate that in everyone? How do we allow everyone to recognize it as their birthright, to have some sense of their own mind and the workings of their own mind and to make meaningful distinctions between the content and thought and the sort of background awareness that's always present and to be more and more aware of that awareness, to be more and more aware of the context within which thoughts and ideas and identity arises and changes. Right. Um, and to how do we weave that very naturally and simply into our edu any educational mm. system, into our families, into just our day-to-day -day life. We have to find ways to weave meditation practices into our daily life. It should be just a part of being human, just like secure attachment is sort of essential for every human. Uh, meditation is essential for every human. You know, I love I love the way that um, another mutual friend of ours, or at least somewhat friend, Daniel Gertz, aka Hanzi. One of the things that I love that he says in the Listening Society is he makes the analogy between modernity and literacy, mm -hmm. and meta modernity and meditation, nice. and basically saying that just as literacy was absolutely essential to modernity. Meditation is essential to meta-modernity. Mm. And I think that that's a really awesome insight and, totally. and a nice meme to propagate because, uh, because the implications are, 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 are unbounded. You know, like human potential is so vast and the gap between human potential and the kinds of um, human norms that we are proliferating through our educational and media ecology, the gap there is so wide that one can't help but to be hopeful if one really just actually really looks looks at what's possible totally. and experiences for oneself and whatever island of sanity you can find what's right. possible. For me, 
you know, I'm still a very optimistic and hopeful person as I see the world burning because <laughs> I know in my communities and in my friends and in the schools that I've worked at, much higher levels of well-being and health and coherence are, are possible. I 100% believe that. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Love the islands of Santa and my garden uh, metaphor is brought to bear in relationship to yeah. finding and cultivating one's garden and creating the bubble in relationship to the bur world burning and having hope for that potential. I, I deeply speak, I get afraid and I can put on my pessimistic glasses, but I deeply feel uh, that, that the internalization of that, the real potential of that, and the orientation to the cultivation of that is um, crucial. And I see your life is really embodying that through and through and it's a beautiful thing yeah thanks brother yeah th and then just to close out sort of where i'm at i sort of just this past year moved to pennsylvania and took on leadership of a waldorf school here mm. which is a really beautiful situation with a lot of potential it's it's a mm. it's a more of a rural area that i'm in now and we have a school that's been around for 80 years and we're we're on 400 acres of really beautiful farmland and it's a pre-k through 12th grade school and Waldorf schools are really interesting. So I said a little bit about Quakerism. Yep, please. How spirituality is grounded. And Waldorf, I would say, is even in some ways more interesting because it comes with a much more um, developed and sort of sophisticated and esoteric background philosophy rooted hmm. in the philosophy of Rudolf Steiner. And there's, there's sort of many different levels that you can sort of enter, like what Waldorf education is all about. Because for most people and for most parents and families who are drawn to Waldorf education, you know, it's really about having a healthy, holistic approach to education where the arts are very integrated. There's, you know, music, foreign language, arts, nature, um, really understanding and respecting a natural developmental slowness where you're sort of not rushing things and you're allowing kids to be kids and you're really letting sort of higher order cognition come online when it's appropriate forcing mm -hmm. young children to do overly academic work and yet there's also a really sort of almost very traditional scholarly almost renaissance like approach to looking at the classics and really having a deep understanding of history but it's a very it's a very well integrated and holistic curriculum but behind it all too is the philosophy of Rudolf Steiner and Steiner's was a pretty esoteric individual. Um, and some, you know, people go really deeply into that and really get a lot out of it. Whereas for most people, they don't really want to get too deeply into Steiner. So it's been an interesting thing for me, you know, actually like Zach and another couple of friends of mine have actually gone pretty deeply into studying Steiner. Yeah. And, and I'm just kind of starting that process myself. But for me, the question isn't so much, you know, it's not really about, um, fully incorporating someone's philosophy and then trying to adhere to it. It's really about what is Waldorf 2.0? Like what mm. should Waldorf look like in the 21st century? In the 21st century? What sort of evolution and innovation has to happen to keep it relevant? But with this really great seed potential of, you know, can we actually have a vision of the human that is evolutionary and developmental and spiritual. And can that be actually front and center in a coherent educational philosophy? And that's really the opportunity that Waldorf education affords because it is, a, is, it is an inherently sort of spiritual evolutionary view of humanity. And it very much sees humanity in process, not just at the individual level with sort of an understanding of what it means to go from birth to some form of enlightenment, but actually collectively understanding that we as a species are going through a really huge transition right now. And I think there's a lot of potential for taking that sort of basic premonition or intuition, but then updating it with a lot more nuance and detail that folks like yourself are, are starting to flesh out. And there's actually a lot of overlap there. Oh, and amazing. Actually, we'll yep. double click and come back to that. Could you give us a little bit uh, you're just diving in. I know a little bit about Rudolf Steiner, but I, you know, I'd love myself a summary. I'm sure other folks would not be necessarily up to date on his frame of reference. Could we just double click on that a little bit and give the gist of what his philosophy was that gave ground to the Waldorf school? Yeah, well, it's a lot. I actually won't okay. say too much about it. I think right. he gets into, he has a, a vision where 
you know, he understands the evolution of humanity in a very cosmic context, okay. you know, like what's happening on this planet and what's happening with the potentials of humans in this vast sort of cosmological okay. scope where, you know, there are, there are in, uh, there are many intelligences and beings at play in okay. the cosmos, so to speak, right? And he's really seeing sort of, uh, influences on what's happening on the planet mm. in that very big big mm. picture view where he feels like there is a purpose and a trajectory of humanity okay. and there is a potential and capacity for each individual and you know, i'm just going to stay very general mm -hmm. and abstract but it's but but basically he was also very critical of materialism and modernity so he's somebody who's writing you know a about a hundred years ago, early mm -hmm. 20th century, and super critical of the materialism mm. and the scientism. And he was mm. already really seeing the downsides of modernity, right? Okay. Was, but very much wanting people to reorient themselves to like, basically already, how do we get past the God is dead sort of realization? You know, he's somebody who was very critical of people like Nietzsche and Kant. Okay. And felt like they were really going to have a negative impact mm. on humanity because the kinds of insights that they were having yeah. were going to lead he almost a very intuitive i feel like he sort of predicted in some ways the fragmentation and downfall of postmodernity, where he could see from people like nietzsche and kant they were planting the seeds for nihilism materialism right right of uh, relativism and he could see that humanity was going to lose its way and was already losing its way and was falling into this very um desacralized disenchanted world and he was looking for a way to re-enchant the world to allow people to see how sacred and holy and really ultimately religious it is and then created this very detailed sort of curriculum and also understanding of child development where He's trying to help people sort of see the evolution of the child and the human in this very sacred religious context where we have these potentials that go far beyond what the sort of conventional modern materialist notion of what it means to be a human being is. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's yeah. beautiful. And it really, I mean, we talked a little bit earlier, again, my own evolution from sort of um, quasi-modern behavioral scientist version of reality. Uh, into this meta modern, oh my God, we need to transcend the traditional, the modern, the postmodern, and recognize and reclaim the human soul and spirit in a particular way and have it be oriented toward a particular kind of guiding light um, of understanding. And then, yes, we have our scientific commitments in a particular way, but that's going to be placed for me at least in some agnostic foundationalism. And what I mean by that is I'm agnostic about the foundational ultimate nature of reality, spiritual, God itself, whatever. Um, I have my particular naturalism inside what I call endo-naturalism from a scientific vantage point. And then we want to extend that into the sacred ultimately um, and be open to that and allow our soul and spirit to be oriented in relationship to that. So that sounds pretty at least somewhat congruent uh, with the relationship yeah. to what he's pointing to there. And that's certainly what I've evolved into. The other thing that I want to double click on is when I built the, the, the sea, the, the garden, um, I'll tell you a little story about where it started because it's relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. So in, it was in 2016 uh, that the garden popped. It was a light bulb moment. I have a couple of them in my history. Um, and uh, we were at a March conference uh, called Cultivating the Globally Sustainable Self. Uh, so it was a bunch of transformational educational leaders uh, that my friend at the time, Greg Shealy, had brought together as a psychologist, and we're asking this question about what is development and what's transformational education in a global setting that has this kind of planetary globalized uh, structure that's really emerging. Um, and it was, it was great. There were brilliant people there. This guy from Africa made a very powerful, uh, impactful uh, articulation with Ubuntu, uh, which is an African philosophy toward the other, essentially toward humanity. I was deeply touched by that. Um, but at the end of the conference, when he bit Craig asked people sort of summarize, okay, so how do we do this, cultivate the globally sustainable self? I actually was not terribly impressed by what emerged. It was a chaotic, fragmented, way too abstract kind of deal. Um, and, and ultimately I was walking out and I, at the time I called my system a two, a UT for unified theory, UA for unified approach. And I'd been yoking them together and actually the Ubuntu thing, I was like, Ubuntu a two, that's kind of cool. Um, 
And then I was walking out and like after that, I was talking to somebody. I was like, you know, what we should do is we should plant it to a seeds and grow it to a trees. Okay. That was the, uh, I didn't ever seen that before in my head, but it was basically, in other words, the children need to be planted with some particular kind of potential, and then they'll grow into some particular vision of what is a healthy, optimal, psychological, really then ultimately oriented into some sort of spiritual um, frame, meaning that their ultimate good, ultimate value. Um, and then when that popped, and all of a sudden the image of the garden happened, um, very shortly after that, I was talking to some people in early childhood education. Um, and we almost actually did this and we got derailed from it, but she was like, we could map an entire nursery school in relationship to this thing. You know, uh, you can have the theme of the garden be woven through, uh, the playground and woven through the curriculum and they learn what the bees are and they learn what the flowers are and you learn what the stone is and you add some sun and some rivers and things like that. And you just situate them in an education unfolding whereby, you know, eventually you get to place, well, it is this stone. Actually, it's the standard theory of elementary particle physics, <laughs> whatever layer that you peel it off and then you just layer that developmental trajectory. So as you're talking about, you know, kind of like, how do we cultivate the genuine on the ground educational developmental process? The, the whole garden structure was like, yeah, what is the abstract knowledge into wisdom structures that could be embedded in a particular place that would afford the naturalistic development that would also lead to deep knowledge and scholarship over time. Yeah, I love that. I love that vision of actually building a school and especially starting with young children around some of your um, themes and symbols of the garden and the tree. I think that's beautiful. I think it's, it's one thing that we we really need is we need experimental innovation around cultivating new kinds of educational environments we need new kinds of schools you know we're, we're i think we're going to need a proliferation of new kinds of educational environments i don't i don't see a way to really scale a fundamentally improved public education system i mean for me it's it's kind of hard to see that maybe it's possible and maybe it's inevitable in some way but what I see more concretely and realistically is a lot of experiments and a lot of small scale totally. schools popping up and, and, and a sort of decentralization, a sort of release potentially of the complexity and overcomplicatedness of our public education system for hundreds of millions of people. Sort of, it's just, we can't keep doubling down. We can't just keep getting more and more complicated and more and more complex and then expecting that to be healthy. We have to find a way to release that complexity and decentralize into more educational innovation? And how do we empower and prepare people to do that in productive and healthy ways? Um, it's still a million dollar question, but I love the idea of just like having a vision for a new kind of school, you know, cause my work even at a Waldorf school, it's like trying to find sort of the best environment I can where there's fertile ground for building something new and something innovative and something relevant and healthy for the future and something that covers the full stack. See, that's the thing too. It's like we can come up with an idea for high school kids. I'm actually involved in sort of a high school project called HS Credit, which is hmm. one version of like, okay, what's a different way to do high school in the digital age? Okay. Right? We can talk about that, but it's, but, but it's not, it, it doesn't go from birth to adulthood. You know, ultimately we need a full stack educational program that goes from or not program but society and culture that goes from birth to death you know the like the, the whole life trajectory of of lifelong education and how do we create environments where that's possible that's the fantasy i think that of what may be emerging in this meta modern when i get optimistic we the you know there's i see these golden threads of different you know people like yourself like me like zach stein and whatever um, that are pulling. In fact, I was just talking to Carla, Dr. Carla Groom, um, who's one of us, basically, although she's in government and behavioral science, and she's trying to evolve the state of governance to fundamentally understand how to relate to individuals and distribute government systems that cultivate intrinsic motivation and growth towards the good and building those kinds of bridges. So um, I, I see the structure that beginning to emerge as a decentralized system and the potential that I get really excited about is that there are these shifts from this chaotic, fragmented pluralism to a real coherent, integrative pluralism, where we're really seeing this fundamental capacity of resonance, you know, 
uh, that was what was absent before, whether it's a function of scientism, whether it's a function of old, rigid, traditionalist notions of you know, Christianity or whatever. But those things do feel like they're coming off and a more mindful notion about our justification systems and more flexible integral perspectives that are affording us to kind of come together and say, hey, we've got partial truths here. Can we stick them together in a way that's really useful? I'm yeah. feeling that uh, shift in this age. And that's one of my most optimistic uh, indicators, I think, that w of what we might be able to achieve. Yeah, yeah, the seeds are definitely being planted, and the potentials are very real. But the work is really hard. You know, that's the. I mean, and it's again, even at a small scale, the actual work of cultivating that kind of perspectival flexibility is really key. And there's really, what I'm coming to in my work is really seeing what are the most essential things to really focus on. Yeah, I and, want to get into this because you you are occupying, I sort of felt that with Carla and the one I just did, she's occupying a really interesting space. Big picture abstract thinker gets some of the real technical stuff, sees the vision and yet works in the system and works with yeah. people in a particular way that don't have access to this kind of issue. And the, I feel, and you mentioned this directly and I wanted to say, hey, this is actually a theme that's emerging. So yeah, let's dive into yeah. this and double click on this. And, and I'm really interested yeah. to hear your thoughts. Yeah, and so there's a, so there's one way that actually this is all coming together for me, which is really interesting because again, these big picture recognitions are really important in terms of what's wrong and having a, having a big history um, and metapsychological understanding of what the problem is, what is this meta crisis that we're living in? So that background is important for leaders to have, but not everybody's going to have that in all its fullness, but somebody has to have it. Some of us do. Right. Some of us <laughs> drop into rabbit holes and then come exactly. back with so, weird gardens. <laughs> but there's like, so there's having that in the background. And then there's also seeing some ways that that meta crisis is manifesting most concretely and immediately for people. And one of the ways is through culture war, right? So like looking at like the work that consilience is doing, looking at mm. propaganda, looking at the media ecology, looking at polarization, looking at culture war, these manifestations of cultural fragmentation, this is where a lot of people are really seeing and feeling and living mm. and manifesting the problem. They don't have the big meta context of the meta crisis, but they're living it in their interactions on social media. So one of the things I'm realizing is that is potentially a leverage point for actually helping to cause the healing that's needed. So for instance, like the implications of the meta view of the meta crisis lead in a certain direction. But if people are going to move in that direction, they're going to have to move through culture war and polarization to get there. Totally. So my focus, like one of the focuses that I'm having at my school is actually talking about these issues of like racism and diversity and equity and inclusion, but in a way that helps people get out of the polarization and the us versus them and to sort of focus on these meta values of relational health, of non-strategic communication, of actual inclusion of different perspectives, of being able to be vulnerable and like honest and not being afraid of what to say and really zeroing in on the health of discourse and dialogue and community. And like, how can we even talk about these polarizing things? And if we can't talk about these polarizing things, or if we can see ways that we in our little community are actually manifesting these unhealthy pathological um, aspects that are, that are actually leading to the dis-ease and dis-health of our society, if we are careful enough and slow enough to see how those things arise in our little community, we're creating that metacognitive and reflective space so that we're already creating a container that is healthier um, and is actually going to be the answer to the meta crisis, right? Like the answer actually is in relational health and conversation and actually creating the kinds of conditions that Habermas is talking about when he's talking about actually having a sort of, you know, uh, healthy communicative action where you're not being strategic and manipulative and propagandizing, but you're actually listening and you're actually allowing some sort of um, meta individual coherence to emerge in a conversation, right? You're actually practicing dialogos, but in a community without having a lot of philosophical or theoretical background to explain to people what you're doing, 
but just keep bringing attention back to the fundamental dis-ease and dis dishealth and pathology of things like feeling like you can't say what you want to say, feeling like you have to say the right thing, feeling fear around getting canceled, feeling like, you know, like the, the, the feeling that people are having in these unhealthy communicative environments, which are really prevalent right now. So I feel like that's really the thing to focus on. And it's actually right. really powerful leverage to use culture war and polarization as a leverage point to awakening healthy dialogue. And that is the bridge to where we want to go in terms of healing the meta crisis. Dude. Preach that. I mean, that is yeah. beautiful. I, so I'm going to double click on some of those things. Let me just, uh, I was getting a lot of association with my friend, Greg Thomas. Uh, so he's a leader, metamodern, thinking about race. Um, uh, I followed him in a number of different ways, had him on here. We did stuff together. Uh, he came down and talked and, and shared his metamodern view of race to my class and made a presentation to our department. And man, the echoes of that, uh, basically bringing uh, he brought very similar themes to what you just uh, laid out to our system. And then the echoes of the conversation about, well, the sort of the justice concerns and the honoring of the past were very similar to sort of the standard. It didn't come at all without oppressive totalitarian. You now need to think this way or you're one of them, you know, and then and then and then all of that opened up so much healthy space for good loving dialogue about authentic ways of being in the world. I was really, really encouraged. It's my sense that it would be. And then I watched it happen. Um, so let me flip it back to you and say, hey, what have you been doing? Or do you have kind of, can you share kind of what you've been seeing in relationship to this? Do you have sort of examples? Do you feel like you're getting a handle on how to do this? Or are you just seeing this as a potential opportunity that you're leaning into? Or where are you in yeah. relation? Yeah, so I've started, I've started having conversations with staff directly about these topics. Okay. And I'm going to start opening these conversations with parents as well. We're going to start something called Conscious Conversations at my school where we have oh, I monthly, love the title. <laughs> monthly or maybe even bi-monthly sort of facilitated conversations where basically, you know, all parents are invited. I'm assuming it'll start with a small group showing up where myself and the school counselor that I'm working with, who, who's very, has deep insight into um, psychology and Buddhist psychology and we're, we're very much on the same page on these things, I'm fortunate. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to help facilitate these conversations with parents and with staff, starting with staff. But basically just, just like, you know, it's sort of already at the front of people's minds that it's like, we have to address race and racism. We have to address diversity, sure. equity, and inclusion. Like as a school, you are obligated to talk about these things. And I'm just wanting to lean into that, but leaning into it in a way where we're helping people to see the conversation that's happening see the field as it's evolving right now, look at the things that are happening in the conversation as opposed to just picking a position in the conversation. Mm. So, so, so sort of like three basic principles that I'm starting the conversation with is I'm saying, look, if we're gonna have this conversation before we enter this conversation, before we get to the point of saying, this is what we think and believe, let's at least have some sort of a basic principles or ground rules or frameworks. Like what's the frameworks that we're using to even have the conversation. So mm -hmm. one is deep history. And I'm just, I'm just kind of laying it out for you very clearly. We have to have some historical understanding of how we find ourselves in this conversation that we're having. We have to have some background understanding of what is modernity? What is post-modernity? What is the age that we're leaning into now? What do these things mean, right? And it just gives me a chance to just sort of iteratively every time we have the conversation say a little bit more about what those things mean to me, let people ask questions, right? So that can be a conversation over time of just like, how do we situate ourselves historically in terms of where we're at right now as a species and as a, wow. as a society? I you have to love that first principle. It's beautiful. So that's okay. one piece. Uh -huh. The second piece is actually rooted for my school. It's rooted in anthroposophy, which is the philosophy of Waldorf education. And one, one point that Steiner makes, which is very deep, which is similar to Buddhism and the middle way, or it's also similar to Aristotelian philosophy in terms of seeing that wisdom is found in relationship to opposites, yep. right? So it's not like courage versus fear or whatever. It's actually like the virtue of courage is found in balancing between like foolhardiness and fear, totally. right? So it's understanding and it's getting out of the good versus evil binary. One thing that yep. Steiner did in his philosophy was he, he 
and it, you know, he, he gets really sort of sophisticated and complicated, but he actually talks about the dynamics between what he calls Lucifer and Araman, but it's really just a way of saying it's not about good versus evil. It's about being, being good or being wise is an understanding polarity and opposites and pulls in different directions and staying in right relationship to them. It's not about choosing one side and being on against the other side. So that really has application in so many different ways. Of like, totally. we have to be able to see polarity and work with polarity and find a path of wisdom that is the middle way. So again, that's just like, it's a meta point. It's an abstract idea, but it ties so directly and concretely into culture war. Let, let me double click on that. Just in, again, the parallels with psychology, psychotherapy, et cetera. So um, the most recent dissertation I supervised um, was, uh, so a lot of what I have people do sometimes is if they're going to go through the UTOC system, uh, they will look at a concept and then they'll do a conceptual analysis. Of where is it currently? So it, often it's in a state of fragmented pluralism. Uh, then does the UTOC system consolidate and organize and does something come out the end that would be been fundamentally useful for the system? That's the sort of method of what I call mental behaviorism, which is organizing the field and moving it from chaotic, fragmented, research-based stuff to coherent conceptual understanding that can be delivered and shared and utilized in you know, the space of understanding. So that's a, but then what most recent one was borderline personality disorder, okay? So borderline personality disorder is this uh, important intense condition of identity, affect, uh, and relation uh, that is then characterized, actually our summary characterization was a dysfunctional polarization that leads to destructive polarities, okay? in contrast to healthy opponent processes that result in a coherent integration, what you get at the core is an emotional system, a relationship system, an identity system that is fragmented and polarized where you flip back and forth between I love you, I hate you, freedom and control issues, positive and negative affectivity, because the system's trying to balance, but it's outside the healthy. So this part hates this part. <laughs> and then you jump into this, you become all of this, you hate the other side, then all of a sudden this does this thing, it flips over. And so what I saw actually in borderline that I'd never seen before, and I made this comment, I was like, this is actually the opposite of Aristotelian virtue balance. You know, it's really, it's basically the opposite of, you know, what he's after in relationship to the polarity. So as she did her dissertation, when we found in sort of this fundamental dysfunctional structural state of identity and relation and affect, we see this opposite. We see this polarized, destructive, vicious cycle uh, system. Uh, and then it was like, oh my God, we can now really frame that. So hearing you talk about that and then put in an education, you know, you really like, wow, that's a very, very uh, generalizable point. And of course you get yin yang singles and things like that. It's like, you're not the only one to think about that, but it's fascinating exactly. to see in the context of no, um, exactly. like modern these psychopathology. Are deep, yeah, no, these deep archetypal insights but they have to be, they're, they're, it's so helpful to be able to name a general, very simple thing, but then see how it applies to what people are experiencing. So basically, like, so the way I'm having these conversations is I'm starting off by talking about these frames explicitly. So a deep historical understanding with some sense of what, you know, what, what is the meaning of modernity, post-modernity and beyond, right? A sense of what is our, what is an understanding of wisdom or right relationship between polarity and seeing the problem of getting caught in polarization. And then the third thing is just really focusing on relational health and the difference between, you know, like real listening and real inquiry versus strategic communication and propaganda uh, and, oh. and, and, and relation. It's like if we're like how we're holding the conversation, how are we listening and responding? And to always prioritize that over the content of anything that's said, mm -hmm. right? So totally. if I tell you to read an article or two, or if I have an idea I want, to sh I want to share with you, that's always secondary to our relationship. It's always right. secondary to the fact that I'm actually not trying to get you to adopt a new ideology. I'm actually not saying go read these articles and then parrot them back to me because this is what you have to believe. It's about what's the quality of the relationship and the inquiry that we are engaging together as a community and it's process oriented, right? So it's not product oriented. It's not like this is where we need to get to this is the thing we need everyone to believe. We need everyone to get on board with this. When you do that in education, it fucks up the process, totally. right? You have to focus on process to get better outcomes. If you focus on outcomes, you mess up the process and the outcome. Totally. And that's a deep educational insight, but it applies 
it applies everywhere. Again, yeah. I'll hit a parallel here. It's unbelievably brilliant and, and totally. So for, for me, the parallel here is understanding what's called the influence matrix. Uh, and the mm. core idea in the influence matrix is that we have a process system that's tracking uh, a central concern of what I call the RVSI line. And that stands for relational value and social influence. Okay, And there are two sides of the same coin here. Uh, but they're also very, very different. So social influence refers to the instrumental capacity to move others in accordance with your interest. So that's the instrumental facet of the kind of having social influence as a resource. Relational value refers to being known and valued by important others, okay? And both serve as this backbone, but they're two different sides of, uh, uh, because you have to sort of solve instrumental problems. And what you're also tracking is long-term stability and long-term uh, felt sense of being in right relation to other. And that's the relational value dimension, okay? Mm -hmm. And I initially just had social influence, but as a clinician, I was like, oh my God, we got lots of social influence, but that will fuck things up if it's controlling, if it's imposter based, if it's all this other stuff, you're actually grounded in being known and valued. And that's the fundamental ground of the human soul, the relational part of the human soul from this vantage point. It's like being known and valued by important others and being taken as valuable as the foundation. Okay, so when you're talking there in terms of, oh, what's strategic communication, how do we create structures where we're going to know what the outcome is, you're essentially basically then operating off of a social influence structure. Okay, and what I discovered clinically is like, yeah, we clearly have that motive, and we're fundamentally tracking that in relationship to relational value, and the core stability ingredient overall is relational value and being known and valued and creating that. And you look at like the capital context, the capital context turns everything into the instrumental uh, bottom line of social, you know, fungible power in terms of what monetary bottom line is. Um, and I see that as a, as a real central conceptual piece. So it's lovely that you landed on that in that final spot there, which basically is like, yes, how are we actually honoring people as ends of themselves to use a Kantian kind of principle or Aristotelian principle is that we were oriented toward the shared eudaimonic space of being. I love that. That's a wonderful yeah. uh, set of principles. Yeah, it's so it's important for this work to be grounded in. Yeah, I mean, they're very simple principles, but somehow the tendency is for people to get so caught up in, again, the, the thought stream, the self stream which is being influenced by so many factors that are unconscious to them that it's like there's just such an unconscious going along with the flow of content and then identifying with that content and then finding yourself in a situation where you have to defend the identity that's associated with the content that's flowing through your self stream. When just a little bit of space around your experience of that enables a different quality of metacognition and reflection and to slow down. And this is why like, you know, again, meditation is so essential. Some groundedness in being in relationship with your thought and your mind. And that like the kind of work that you're doing to really point out all these different aspects of what the self is and what the mind are, you know, three different kinds of mind. I, I really like, I feel like that's all part of the same work because you're helping to sort of look at instead of look through. And the more that you can do that, the more different kinds of ways you can do that, the more you're facilitating and up-leveling. And, and one way or another, it's a developmental capacity, I think, where you're becoming more conscious and more metacognitive and more aware. And these are the sort of foundational skills and capacities that literally every human has to cultivate to some degree if they want to be in the conversation that's actually making things better and not making things totally. worse. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, what we need is we need the cultivation of the being as you were talking about, and that's what you're doing. I think to get there, given how fucked up our knowledge systems were, we need some crazy people like me diving deep into the <laughs> arcane structure, pulling out some knowledge structures, getting us clear so that when we ask the principle-based questions, we can say, hey, this seems right. How do these various principles link up? And they're like, okay, we can now extract an abstract system for a subset of people that need that as a, um, a set of understandings that lead to wisdom. And then you got to then just translate that into the ground of being for everyday people. And that's what you're doing in relationship to the school. It sounds like, sounds really, really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You need, you need the, you need the framework and the story so that people can make sense of it and trust in it experientially, you know, so that you can kind of have, 
have the faith and trust in whatever process you're engaged in and to let whatever, whatever your identity is to have some grounding in like, okay, I have a framework or a story that my identity can make sense of enough that I can engage this process that will then actually in some ways loosen up and uplevel my identity over time. Yeah. So I am curious, this more pragmatic question just uh, just popped into my head and I'm curious, what does a day look like for you? I wouldn't know what it would be to run yeah. a school. So I just all of a sudden got yeah. curious, hey, what does a day for Brad look like? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a lot of meetings, you know, it's, it's a <laughs> lot of, and a lot of email, frankly. I don't know how people ran organizations prior to email. It's like, so it's such an interesting thought experiment to like think like, wow, would, everything would go so much slower. It would actually be so much better in so many ways. Because it's, it's mm -hmm. a lot of email and a lot of meetings is what it comes down to. Okay. Helping, people, um, helping people make decisions and making decisions. And also, you know, problems tend to trickle up. So yeah. it's like when something, you know, that what I, I sort of half jokingly refer to myself as, as the therapist in chief, actually, because... There's many ways that I think this is the case if you're sort of in a leadership position in any organization, but I think at a school, you know, there's a few hundred people in our community and there's going to be interpersonal conflict. There's going to be disagreement. There's going to be a lot of just interpersonal stuff that bubbles up and often those kind of need guidance and help and support. Okay. Um, so I find myself, it, it's ultimately working with people and helping mm -hmm. teachers and parents uh -huh. um, navigate whatever their challenges are in their and their part of the of the community, and then making sure that whatever's happening with that problem is sort of in right right relationship with the whole school. And uh -huh. frankly, a big part of the work right now is dealing with the sort of pervasive um, stress and anxiety of living in a in a pandemic. And uh, it's also of kind of hard to remember what, what would it be like to run a school not during COVID times is kind of a distant memory at this point. Um, I mean, I just, I had a meeting yesterday with a leadership team and our sort of COVID coordinator nurse talking about, you know, what's happening with the new strain and do we need to change policies when we come back in January? And we actually had a little outbreak at our school, um, which included me actually having COVID last mm. week. And we actually shut down school Thursday and Friday before winter break. And it's just, there's a lot of communication that has to happen around that, a lot of messaging that has to happen. Like when, when, when we started this school year, I sort of wrote a letter to my school community that really framed the COVID issue very broadly hmm. and really sort of similar to the DEI conversation and sort of having a frame for hmm. how to have that conversation. I've tried to do the same thing around COVID because oh, nice. there's actually a lot of polarization <laughs> in this community in particular yeah, okay. around COVID, I'd say the majority of folks are afraid of COVID and they're, they're vaccinated and they care very much about following all the guidelines and making sure everyone's safe and wanting to avoid it at all costs. Mm -hmm. And then there's actually some people in our community who really are more on the other side in terms of like, maybe they're not getting vaccinated and whether they are or not, they're feeling a little bit like the, um, the emotionality and psychology of the response to COVID is sort of out of proportion yep. to their actual lack of fear around the virus itself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I can really relate to that side. I feel like we've gotten to the point where we can really ask some questions about the proportion of the response to totally. the actual concern. And there's so many psychodynamics and patterns and there's so much psychopathology in our collective psyche in terms of how we are responding and reacting, how we're scapegoating, how we're caught in these polarization totally. apps around COVID and vaccines. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's a whole other no, conversation. That's totally, right? But, no, that's a that's a great that's point, a though. Leader, it shows I've got the, hold all of that. Yeah, it shows yeah. the well, it shows the applicability of the what it is to take the process view and adopt those principles. Because uh, I think it's almost always um, the case that when you find yourself in these kinds of things. You could apply this view with a lot of utility. Um, and certainly speaking for myself, although I'm all vaccinated, I generally follow the rules. I'm actually very thankful um, for a lot of folks uh, for stepping up and being like, wait a minute, 
the reactivity of this thing um, is extremely high and the cost of this reactivity is extremely high and we may well be getting this thing way out of proportion. So at a dialectical perspective of being like, yeah, no, thanks for standing up and, and holding uh, some lines here in relationship to us avoiding herdish groupthink and panicking over something that creates a lot more uh, you know, damages than the illness itself. And there's definitely a lot to be said for that kind of uh, sense. Of yeah. I'm in a very, I'm in a very similar place. And as the leader of an organization, I have to hold that balance and try to communicate it and really, really stay on that razor's edge and thread the needle between like, we're going to follow the guidelines. We are oriented towards safety. And yet we are not falling to the extreme of fear. We're not, I'm not mandating vaccines. We're not, we're not, we're not going to try to get totalitarian on, on that on this but we're also you know we're not going to be to the other side either um and sort of justify you know a sort of general anti-vax sentiment so it really having to hold that and really having to communicate in a way where ideally people on both sides can actually hear and respect the perspective that we're trying to hold as as an organization it is a big part of the work and i'd say communicating both and perspectives consistently like there's so many things where you have to hold the both and, and you have to acknowledge this and the other, and then try to find a policy or a language that really holds both. And there's just so many examples of that in, in, in so, leadership. It's like you're, you're taking in as many perspectives as possible. You're seeing that people in your community are seeing things from different perspectives. You're also seeing that you're not really going to get them to agree with each other. And yet ultimately you have to land somewhere. And what's the wisdom and discernment in choosing where to land, but then how to communicate where you're landing to people who actually disagree with you in multiple different ways. And it's sort of, it's just so many catch 22s around people mm -hmm. like getting it from both sides and having people be unhappy for different reasons and never being able to please everyone. And yet having the clarity and integrity to know why you're landing where you're landing and to be able to explain it to people who disagree with you is, is really what it's all about. That's beautiful. Uh, and actually, again, I'll draw another parallel. When I'm doing clinical work, it's not uncommon that I'll um, organize my understanding in relationship to what's sometimes called modes or parts work, whereby the psyche um, carries certain kinds of charges and desires and wishes, as you were probably aware of at various times. And then the problem, again, sort of like that borderline metaphor is like, hey, you've got all of these different desires in you and they compete against one another. Uh, and they want various things in relation. And then you get also you get these voices in your head. Uh, and one of the great challenges of being a human person is how do you listen to those particular voices? Uh, how do you, you know, honor them for what they're, you know, giving you in terms of information at the same time, they want certain different things in the short and long term in relational spaces across all sorts of different contexts. And thus, how do you find a coherent integrated system? Uh, that affords acknowledgement and at the same time makes decisions and gives you a particular path that you end up following because you can't follow them all and does so in a way that moves the system together uh, reasonably well along like an internally good functioning family or yeah. uh, school or whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another, for me, there's another quality or aspect to it that is, that is all important. And it actually loops us back to our reference earlier to the awareness Street, or just awareness of awareness and I feel like I, I mentioned there's lots of different ways that we can take both and perspectives on things but for me one, one way that I put it is there's there's also the big both and or like the, there's there's the ultimate both and capital B capital A which is the paradox that things are always imperfect and always in process and it's always a series of compromises and yet somehow at the same time everything's okay like everything, there is actually a wholeness where everything fits together. And there is this sort of grand perspective um, and just just the grand, huge okayness and goodness and maybe even perfection of everything. Mm -hmm. And if you are actually, the more you're grounded in awareness, mm -hmm. the more you're actually grounded in the simple perfection of each moment. And the more you're grounded in that, the more all the decisions that you have to make and all the all the imperfections and the compromises and the disappointments, it's all still held in this context of like, yeah, but it's somehow it's all okay, actually. Totally. And actually, I'm not going to allow other people's dissatisfactions and upsets um, and sort of partial truths to sort of 
pull me out of my awareness of awareness where everything's actually okay in every moment. And I think the more we can be grounded in that, the more we're actually going to be able to make stable, consistent, um, healthy, coherent decisions, but also the more we're going to be transmitting to other people in relationship, even on a, on an unspoken level, it's okay. Like, it's okay. You know, like it's, okay. yes, I know you're stressed. I know you're worried. I know COVID sucks and you don't want your child to be on quarantine. I know your teacher's not perfect. I know you're frustrated. You're probably upset with your spouse and your boss too, but it's like, you, you know, just, just be with your child, you know? And that's why, and, and that's like the kindergarten teacher in me coming out to like, if you can just be in the company of children and just enjoy the experience of being human with young humans, there's a quality to that, that I think a lot of adults lose, lose, they lose sight of they, and, and they lose contact with. And how do we help people stay connected to just that being which children exude, you know, and that, that's one of the joys of working at a school with children is they can help us reconnect and being a parent, your children can, they can also pull you out of it and really piss you off, <laughs> but, but, but they can also help you reconnect. And it's, it's that. so important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, that. And I expanded into that, you know, like a year and a half ago, went through my little wisdom energy phase <laughs> where basically, I mean, I had some notions about that literally dropped for a couple of weeks. <laughs> into a pre-trans justificatory alignment of being itself where I really, um, and now can access that with a lot of regularity. So yeah, in other words, you yeah. take that self and all of its wounds and all of its others and all of its cares. And then there's something, the witness function beneath that and the alignment to the good above it in a particular kind of way. And then, you know, there's a way to cohere in relationship to that space where all what you just said is, it can't even be stated because it simply is embodied in relation yeah totally totally and that's what it's all about and that's what that's what we're all here to to learn and to teach i think on some level you know and everything else that we're doing is in service of that ultimately I love that yeah totally well there are a couple other things we could possibly touch on we'll see if, you, if, you, if you're uh, yeah. so inclined um you know one thing i wonder if we'd circle into is integral and in you talk uh, that'd be one possibility uh you know in terms of I, uh, you know, seen, I feel more and more affinity to the integral world uh, over the last five years, and it's just, just growing, and we could possibly discuss that and seeing complementarities. I'm also curious to hear about what's on your horizon in relationship to kind of like, uh, how you've been there now just at the school, do you have a sort of visions for that, or you're, you're feeling into growing into that, or other aspects of your professional identity? Are you trying to, um, you know, leverage your book in a particular way or or any other kinds of things that uh, you see uh, as you're growing into in the in the horizon of this time yeah thanks let's I'll I'll uh I'll lean into the to the latter question you know I think I mean integral I, I'll just say too and I said this before we started recording I've been appreciating your work more and more hmm. as I've been practicing over these last few months I feel like when when we first met and the first couple of times we spoke it was like you know, I, I saw there was a part of me that was like, I wanted to know that you really got integral before I took your system seriously. You know, it was sort of like, well, if, if I'm really going to spend time learning this guy's whole system, I need to know he at least has the capacity to really get integral theory. Because some people just don't. But if you don't, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time on your system. Because Right. So just so it's like, there's a little bit of skepticism yeah, at first. And, then, and as I've followed your work over these past few months, it's really, oh, okay. Yeah. Like there's it's there's so much that's clicking and I'm really appreciating it. And I'm also seeing, yeah, seeing how over time you I feel like you're integrating the background insights of integral and of people like Arl Bindo and like spiritual mm -hmm. teachers into your work. And it's making it for me feel like it really is this this um just 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 this beautiful next iteration of really what is the integral impulse basically mm -hmm. you know yeah. actually i love our our uh, our mutual friend layman pascal and something that he wrote he referred to integral theory as um something like first wave meta modern theology mm, right and I, I love that love because that. it's like you know there's this overall impulse or wave or trajectory or capacity that is post-postmodern in some yep. way and whether it's integral or meta-modern 
it's this thing and it's pulling us along and it's we're feeling into it and we're fleshing it out and it is this integrated emergence that's happening um 100%. and i feel like so you're aligned with it integrals aligned with it hanzi and metamodernism and a lot of it's aligned with it and the more that we can really see it as this integrated emergence and not be overly um you know identified with 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 any particular framework and seeing how the frameworks are fluid and they're meant to evolve and develop you know integral theory itself a lot of people don't really understand has many different waves to it and it's still evolving it was always meant to be open-ended it was never meant to mistake the map for the territory so that's that's all i want to say on that just in general i Love feel it. like there's alignment there's coherence totally and there's right. most importantly there's uh there's there's just a metacognitive flexibility involved in the whole process where it's not like oh the integral theorists believe this and the meta monitors think this and then greg has this system and it's like not holding the conversation in that way at all but really holding it again this integrated emergence that's just flowering um so it's just beautiful so i i just love all of the the dovetail that's happening there and the way that you know i've been I've been connected to many people in the integral community for many years, and it's cool to see now that that's really expanding into the into this wider circle of people of, of the sense making community. It's cool, um, Love it. and for me, yeah, and for me and my personal, where I'm going with sort of all of that in the background, I'm I'm looking to engage in really concrete projects that sort of manifest new possibilities for the future. So leading a Waldorf school is one piece of what I'm doing, and there's three other projects I'm actually involved in right now. Mm -hmm. I'll just, just mention, and then maybe Please. some later conversation, we could even go into them more. So one I mentioned briefly, I'm involved in this project to create a digital platform for high school students to earn project-based credits that would enable them to do projects and create podcasts and videos as a way of earning credits as juniors and seniors in high school that would get oh. them out of dysfunctional public educational systems. Oh, wow. So there, it's, it's called hs.credit or hs credit system. Okay. And okay. it's the, it's the brainchild of a guy named Nadav Zamer, who's, uh, he's actually a, a physicist and mathematician and also a public school principal in Harlem. Oh, wow. Um, super interesting guy. So I've been kind of helping him out a little bit in consultation and working with his organization. Um, which is just sort of really nascent sort of startup nonprofit, but it's a really cool vision for creating and it's actually creating credits on like a blockchain NFT sort of. Hmm. Model. Um, so that's one thing that I'm engaged in. Another thing I've been engaged in is called the Reconstitution Project. Hmm. And that's actually something that Layman Pascal and I, along with a, a few other people, Ryan Nakade and Nate Kaufman and Rachel Mincy, we've been meeting every other week for more than a year, maybe almost two years at this wow. point, uh, developing a, a basically a framework of amendments, almost like writing a new constitution. We're basically writing a new constitution for the country that just as a thought experiment for the most part of trying to answer what would an integrated system of amendments look like that would actually solve all the problems of government, basically. Um, oh. <laughs> we've been yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, so we've actually been meeting every other week for, for over a year. We're almost we like we're 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 going to shape ten amendments. So basically, ten amendments that all hang together to sort of create a new sort of um, twenty first oh, century. Book. That's so cool. Obviously, Layman's yeah. one of my favorite people in this space. Yeah, so oh, Layman's uh, he's uh, so wonderful. I uh, love him. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's been really cool to get to know him and meet with him regularly on this on this project. And then an offshoot of this is actually educational. So, and actually I mentioned to you, we were close to you in um, Virginia a few right. weeks ago. She met and like had a little retreat as a group. And we sort of, one of the ideas that we fleshed out is how to create a course for either high school students or college students that would actually teach people how to be meta ideological in their thinking wow. so that they could actually do things like what we're doing like the way that we're approaching constitutional governance is from a meta ideological lens like ryan and nate are the two guys two of the people who are involved in this project they started their own podcast called the meta ideological politics podcast. so it's uh, at a at a more general level in addition to the concrete project of creating these this sort of constitutional structure um ultimately it's about thinking meta ideologically 
right? Hmm. And so now we're actually developing this course called Beyond Civics, which is about helping young people to think meta ideologically and actually weaving together sort of DEI work around identity in a way that helps people sort of, again, get metacognitive about their identity, get metacognitive about what's happening in society and culture war, and then looking at politics with some of those tools, like you learn how to look at yourself in a sort of meta identity kind of way. And then you learn to look at politics in a meta ideological kind of way to really focus on solving problems and going through the thought experiment of something like a constitutional convention, where it's like, if you actually had a chance to rewrite the constitution, how would you do it? And how do you bring a meta ideological lens to that project? So that's something that we're working on. Yeah, that's which is exciting. Beautiful. Yeah, it's exciting because I mean, that might get really concrete. Like we're actually going to build this course. Right. I'm actually going to propose actually teaching it to maybe seniors at my school mm. next year. And then we'll see if we can sort of scale it from there to sort of teach it in different places, maybe even build a curriculum where it's like this meta ideological beyond civics curriculum. So that's, a, that's another unbelievable parallel. So my next uh, conversation with I have ongoing conversations with laymen. Uh, we're mostly broadcasting. Uh, so we went from the psychopathology angle the, from you talk in the last couple of conversations, and then we woven into um, he internalized trans justificatory. Um, so, you know, justification systems. And he's like, okay, well, and he, and that I didn't actually use that term historically, but now, so in real, we're going to now fundamentally explore the trans justificatory mindset or way of being, which then would be very similar to a meta ideological way. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, the networks of propositions are systems of justification. They certainly come with some perspectival procedural shit, use some of John's language, but fundamentally, a lot of this is this propositional network of justificatory narratives that legitimize is an ought. And then the issue fundamentally is getting perspective on them. And so we're, he had, you just internalized the language of trans justificatory, which I was immediately drawn to. In fact, when I developed in 1996, the whole idea of justification, it afforded me a particular kind of perspective on us that was that felt new. Other people had certainly seen it in various ways, but I have my unique angle on it. So listening to you talk about, hey, how do we cultivate this meta ideological perspective? Uh, it's just brilliant. It's exactly, it's, and that is uh, the sensibility of what we're, of what we need. Uh, and that does afford all of these kind of contextual things that allow for the growth of the more optimal, healthy opponent process, way of relating, cultivating relational value, understanding of our contextual history. That's great stuff. Yeah, it really is. It's been it's a great project and group of people. I, I, I forgot to mention Ari Allen is actually the person who mm. kind of brought us all together. He's got a couple of medium articles mm. and he's also the one who sort of helped us frame the reconstitution.com website. And Ryan Nakade, I'll mention, also has a series of Medium articles sort of about meta-ideological mm -hmm. thinking, mm -hmm. and he's really been the one developing those, those ideas. So I can point I'd love to make them. connection with those guys. If, if you're yeah, Ari, Ari and Ryan would be great people to have on, either to okay. talk about, the, either, I would say Ari to talk about the reconstitution or Ryan to talk about just his, his thinking about meta-ideology, because he is actually a mediator and he works with people very concretely and directly in terms of having DEI conversation. And oh, he's wow. really he's really doing the work of trying to help get out of the polarization, you know, get out of the sort of ideological identity that people get get caught in. And he's doing the work really concretely with groups of people. And he's also writing really short, clear, like series of essays that are kind of laying out like what being meta ideological is all about. Wow. That sounds good. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah, exciting oh, stuff. Nice. And then actually, so then the last thing, I just yep. I just joined another organization on the on the board of directors for a nonprofit called uh, the Karuna Mandala Initiative. And this is a vision of actually starting, there's actually a few different pieces, but one piece is starting what's called Karuna Schools. So it's a notion to start basically a network of schools around the globe that are really that are tied to sort of eco-villages. Where finding different places in the world to have a full community eco village with a school that really, you know, with the with this really ideal vision of like from birth to death, how do you have a school that includes the whole community that includes parent education and adult education, and that's actually grounded in a comprehensive integration of Buddhist psychology and Western developmental psychology. So it's really like in the framework of basically becoming a Buddha or becoming an awakened human, right. what would a school look like 
that's actually like some combination of like Waldorf 2.0 plus like Mahayana Buddhism plus like the monastic tradition. Like how would you actually weave all that together to create something called the Karuna School? Um, and this is being led by Dr. John Churchill, who's a good friend of mine, who also yeah, is a sure. Buddhist teacher. And it's sort of his, he and his wife, it's sort of their thing. And they've, they've, mm -hmm. they've brought me on board to be on their board and help them think about how to, how to manifest that. The term Karuna, uh, where does that? Uh, yeah, so that's a Buddhist term, Karuna. Um, showing my ignorance here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically um, just another synonym for like wisdom and compassion. You know, like, and that's, so like a Karuna mandala would be like a mandalic vision for like wisdom and compassion. Oh, yeah. okay. Well. Yeah, very similar. <laughs> that, that, I mean, your mandala, but, you know, it's but, kind of a Karuna mandala, I would say. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. Indeed. It is, it is. It, <laughs> it's it's got a, that flavor. It, it is, no, it's beautiful. I mean, there's these deep impulses in all of us, Greg. That's the thing, like we all want utopia. We all have this intuition of awakening and growing up and waking up and being in community with other people who are actually manifesting beauty and goodness. And it's, it's so tangible and it's so possible. And there's so many different ways that we can manifest it. And that actually a lot of them are happening. You know, there's a lot of good news to be shared in the world. People, you just, you know, if you, if you, if you just tune into the right conversations, you'll see that the chaos actually is the process that needs to happen. And I'm, I'm very, it makes me feel very hopeful about the future. Hmm. It's beautiful. And, and that brings us to, I think a good, good point uh, in this conversation to, to really you know, consolidate. Sure. So, um, so for me, the, the, this has been you know, very enriching. Uh, so I deeply, deeply appreciate the vision that you're enacting is exactly to me, the kinds of visions that are, well, moves us, you know, the baton of energy information that you are, are moving us toward the light there, Brad. And it's a beautiful thing at multiple levels as we are in the now itself. Uh, and I appreciate that simultaneously. So, I mean, that's a, you know, amen, brother. Keep doing what you're doing. It's unbelievable uh, kinds of stuff. And that's what adds to the good, true, and beauty of the world. Thank you, brother. It's really nice to connect with you. And I have deep appreciation for, for what you're doing. And I'm glad we can sync up and hope we can talk again. Great. Yeah, man. Let's come back to some of these uh, other projects in a little while and see where they've grown to and where what other areas uh, that you're pressing into. So, Sweet. all right, man. Thanks so much for sharing. Really appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Have a man. good holiday and uh, all right. take care. All right. All right. Peace. Bye-bye.